Hello everyone, it's Kevin from KJD Electronics, and welcome back to another one-stop programming video for absolute beginners on Python. In the last video, we went over an introduction to exceptions and loops, and in this video, we're going to go a little bit more into exceptions and how to clean up our code to make it neater and easier to maintain. So I'm going to start out by going over the challenge I posed at the end of the last video, which asked you guys to make our calculator program here loop indefinitely as long as the user wanted to continue doing calculations. So to accomplish that, I added an outer while loop here, another while loop, based on the user condition uh, variable that I created in the first line of the main function. And I set it to true so that our while loop will execute at least once. And notice I had to indent everything down here to be within our while loop. So everything is contained in there. And then everything from here to here, I didn't change. That's our old program. And then I added a comment for ask user to continue. We know what this code is doing. And I created a variable based on the input, user yn. Would you like to run another calculation? Y for yes, or any other value to exit. Now the reason I said any other value to exit is just to simplify the conditions that I'd be checking uh, to make it much easier only have to check against one value, lowercase y. Uh, you guys could have chosen to do that in a number of different ways, and that's fine. So then I had an if statement. If user yn does not equal y, so if we got a value other than y, we want to set user continue to false. And then I have a new keyword down here, well, two new keywords actually, break and continue. Now, break and continue are what are called loop control keywords they control the, the loop that's currently active, which in this case is this while loop. Break does kind of what it suggests, and it will break out of the loop. So if I had a break in this while loop right here, at some point it would break out of this while loop and go down here, and it wouldn't affect this while loop. So you can only break out of one loop at a time. Similarly with continue, that will stop executing the current code and restart the loop. So for example, if I put a continue right above this, that would, when it got to that, it would skip back up to line 24 and get the input again. So continue restarts the loop, break exits the loop. Here it's completely redundant and unnecessary because we don't need to say continue at the end of the loop to go back and restart it again. But I wanted to do that here to illustrate what the keywords do. Same thing with the break. We set the condition to false, which will cause this loop to exit, and then we break out of it, which is, again, completely redundant. You can pick one of the approaches. And that sums up the challenge from the last video. Let's run it real quick to make sure everything works. We'll run our main function. What is number one? One, one, we'll add, we get two. Would you like another running calculation? Yes, and then it restarts and we get four, perfect. I'll enter some gibberish and press enter, and then we exit. Perfect, worked exactly how I expected. All right, now before we completely wrap up this challenge, I wanna introduce a, a, a slight variation which will allow me to introduce the for loop, which we won't really get that much into until we cover data structures in the next video, but I wanted to introduce it now because I think it's a good opportunity. So let's say our user wanted to loop three times. So if we get rid of what we just added and we get rid of this user continue, so now we have this indentation and we've got this while loop here that doesn't reference a variable, but let's change it to a for loop. So I'll type for i in keyword range three. I would help if I spelt range right. So for i in range three, and then I have our program. What do you guys think that's gonna do? A for loop is just another kind of loop. And range is a function that we can use with a for loop to say, run this number of times. So basically this will allow the, this for loop to iterate over this range of zero, one, and two, which is what this will create uh, a range of. So if we run this, I'm just going to enter 1 for everything, and we'll notice 
it ran three times. The for loop basically allows you to loop uh, an X number of times. Instead of while a condition equals something, the for loop loops X number of times. And you also get this handy dandy index value. So I is just a, a terrible name that us programmers use because we're, we're too lazy to type out the full word index. But I is just referencing an index because usually you use the for loop to loop over a data structure where you have an index for that data. But again, I don't want to go too much into this. I just want to introduce that this exists and we will go more into the for loop and how it's used in the next video when we talk about data structures. All right, so I'm actually going to go back to the version of the program where we just run it once. Oops. So I'm going to get rid of our loop and indent stuff back to the main function. So this is the original version of the program we had before you guys did the challenge. We will finish up with our calculator in this video, but I wanted to go over a little bit more on exceptions and how to make our program a little bit more cleaner before we finish it out. If we look at this, we'll notice that this accept in our try accept block is underlined. And in, uh, PyCharm will tell us too broad exception clause. Now, exceptions are of specific types. So really what we want is value error. Now if you remember in the console from the last video, you would see the error value error, or the text, the type value error in the console before we had our try accept block. So what this is saying is this will only catch the value error exception. If some other issue occurs, this accept block will not catch it. Now the reason that's good programming and clean code is you don't want to print an exception for invalid input when you're not sure that it was invalid input. It could have been some other random issue that just is gonna make your life harder because you're like, well, the input's valid and you're gonna enter the input 10 times, you're gonna pull your hair out because you're gonna swear the input is valid and then you're gonna get more in the debugging and find out that it's actually something completely unrelated. So that's why we try to bind these accepts as much as possible. You can actually have another one down here that catches the uh, unknown exception. And you can say print unknown error. Now that will at least tell you that something strange has happened. And if it does happen a lot, then you can add whatever exception type that is and print whatever error you want to the user there. Now, this is a calculator program. There's one other place in this program that can throw an exception. And I'm gonna give you a chance to guess before I show you. So pause it if you wanna think about it and look through and try to find the other place that throws an exception. All right, we have a division function that returns num1 divided by num2. What would happen if we put in zero for num2? Turns out we would get a divide by zero exception. So let's handle this nicely in our division function. Let's add a try accept block. And we can just do try return num1 divided by num2, which is exactly what we want to do. And then accept. And if we start typing divide by zero, you'll see that we get zero division error, uh, which will autocomplete for us. And we'll add our colon. And we can just say print handled div by zero, returning zero. And then we can just artificially say that it, whenever we get a divide by zero error, we're gonna return zero. That's not really true what happened. It's not mathematically correct, but let's just say that's what we're gonna do in our program so we don't get an exception and it blows up. All right, so that's it with exceptions. But there's a couple more things that I wanna to do to make our code a little bit cleaner. Now, if you scroll down here back down to our main function, if we look at our operation line, we can see that it's underlined and it says pep8 line too long over 120 characters. Now, if we look over here, we'll see this line, imaginary line, vertical line over on the right hand side of our uh, development window. And that's our visual for what 120 characters is. Now this is a really easy, easy thing to fix. We can just go here, we can press enter, and it will auto magically 
uh, create a, a new string for us, add the appropriate quote and quote. And now this is wrapped uh, and we will print the exact same thing, except it looks a little bit cleaner and is a little bit easier to read. All right, and now looking at our main function, I also wanna clean this up a little bit because it's, it's pushing its length limit. It's getting kind of lengthy and I, I wanna shorten it down a little bit to make our code easier to read. So a real quick way to do that would be to kind of outsource our determinant operation uh, logic here. And if I create a new function called def run operation, and I pass in our operation, and I'm not gonna forget our comment, our doc string, I'm gonna say determines the operation to run based on the operation argument, which should be passed in as an int. Awesome. So then I can just copy paste what we have down here up into our determine operation function. And then I'll also need to pass in num1 and num2. Now, I didn't realize that at first, but then when I pasted it, I saw that we needed num1 and num2 because it underlined them in red. So I added them. And that's kind of part of what programming is, is you say, I want to do this. And then as you're doing it, you figure out how to do it. Now, that's not always the best approach. Sometimes you want to design exactly what you're doing and understand it beforehand. But sometimes it's okay just to play around and make it work as you go. All right, so now down here in our main function, all I have to do after we get our input is call our run operation function with operation num1 and num2. Now I can run this. What is number one? Five. What is number two? Five. What do we want to do? Let's multiply. Multiplying 25. Now, our main function is just so much cleaner with this operation code outsourced up here. Now, if you notice, we've got these other underlines here that say pep8 expected two blanks line lines found one. So that's really easy to fix. We will just add the required blank lines between our functions and those go away. All right, so I'm gonna do something real quick here and I'm gonna create a new Python file. I'm just gonna call this test.py. Now bear with me here because I wanna get this into this video because the next video, we're just gonna to try to tie up some loose ends uh, with some stuff that we haven't covered yet before we get onto the really fun stuff moving forward. So I wanna start tying up loose ends now so I have more time in the next video to go over lists, dictionaries, and other data structures. So we've got this new file called test.py, and I'm going to introduce a new keyword called import. Now what import does is it basically tells Python, go get this other thing that's not this file and import it so I can use it here. Now I'm going to introduce two things that we can import right now, and that's time and random. So notice how PyCharm makes them gray. That's because they're not used yet. Once they're used, they'll go back to their normal color. So time is uh, basically a package. Uh, it lets you access time-related things, including sleep. So if I say time.sleep1, that will make Python sleep for one second. It will basically not do anything for one second. So I can say print sleeping. And then after that, I can say print awake. And then we also have random that I imported. So let's say random dot rand int and let's print the results of that so let's run this 
and we'll have to edit our run configuration and say instead of main, we're going to add a new run configuration for Python, and we'll call this test. And we want to run, in our hello world, we want to run test.py. Say apply, everything else should be good, OK. So now if we say run test, sleeping, awake. Now we missed two arguments from randint because I was, I'm being hasty and trying to get through this video because we're, we're dragging on here now. But it wants two arguments for the start and end of its range. So we run this again, sleeping, awake four. If we run it again, sleeping, awake three. So we got a random number there. So to summarize what this means, we can import things. And these are external things to our program. There's a whole uh, variety of different suite of them. Eventually, we'll be able to import files that we've written and use them in a, basically the exact same way. Uh, in this case, I've imported time and random and introduced time.sleep, which lets our program just not do anything for however many seconds that we specify in the argument. And then random, rand int, which takes two arguments uh, that are integers. That's essentially the range of the integer that's going to be random that we're generating. A point on clean code, your import statement should always go at the very tippity top of your file in the first lines. So you should never you know, see something like this, where this is fine, but this is going to tell us that we should put it back at the top. This would run. It's just not stylistically correct, and it's really hard to see what the dependencies are for this file. All right, so this leads me to two challenges, and this is really why I want to introduce time and random here. In our calculator program, try to use random and maybe the for loop that we introduced today to just run a bunch of random math. You know, however, however random you want to make it, just run random math, and you know, you can watch the, the console stream by lots of different you know, results, and it'll be fun. The second thing, the second reason I want to introduce time and random is they were used by a user a couple weeks ago, uh, Zibzo, uh, giving him a shout out, and he submitted this rock, paper, scissors game application that just used these time and random, everything else that we've learned, to make a simple rock and scissors game. Now, the solution for that, what he submitted, is posted on the forum, and I will link to that in the description of this video. But go ahead and try to implement that yourself before you go ahead and look at his solution. And also remember to use these clean code. Uh, and what exactly is in the solution isn't necessarily clean code, so see if you can spot those differences and make those improvements. Now, going forward, we're going to use this new rock, paper, scissors idea to kind of step away from our calculator and we'll use that going forward. We won't quite go into it that much in the next video because we'll be looking at data structures and tying up some other loose ends before we get into the really fun stuff. All right, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Kevin from KJD Electronics.